Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us for this next very exciting installment of the Natural Capital Conversations. Today we're going to be exploring the question, is the science and practice of resilience changing the way we do development? And we have a really exciting lineup today. I'll do a little bit more introductions in the next few slides, but first I want to admit that you know, there's that word mantle. I noticed that we, we have kind of a fannel here, which I must say I'm, I'm excited about, but uh, maybe next time we'll strive for a little bit more diversity. Okay, so next slide. The uh, Natural Capital Conversations are uh, put together by the Natural Capital Project, which is a partnership of many different in on the world. Um, some of the core partners are shown on the bottom of the slide here. We're centered at Stanford University. And today we're featuring um, our partners from the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University. And ultimately, the Natural Capital Project is working to pioneer the science, technology, and partnerships that enable people and nature to thrive. And back during the darker days of the pandemic, we launched this series, Natural Capital Conversations, um, to help um, spark conversations with scientists and practitioners and leaders in government and business so that we can have engaging discussions and learn from one another's experiences and promote connections across different time zones and different parts of the world. And we've, over the course of the series, we've featured everything from climate smart coastal planning to cultural ecosystem services to things like today's topic, exploring uh, resilience thinking and um, new ways of doing development as we think about moving toward the ambitious agenda out in uh, the sustainable development goals. Okay, so next slide. Today's conversation, we have a really exciting lineup, including Jamila Haider from Stockholm Resilience Center, Maya Schluter, also from Stockholm Resilience Center, Michelle Lee Moore, also from SRC, you'll see a theme here. And the session has been put together by Belinda Reyers, who is a professor at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, where I am currently visiting her, which is why my camera is off, because my internet is a little bit questionable where I am at the moment. I promise I'm a real person, but Belinda also has appointments at the Stockholm Resilience Center at the Bayer Institute and the um, Stockholm Resilience too, I believe. Okay, next slide. Just a few housekeeping kinds of things I think are next. So our agenda here is, I guess I didn't introduce myself. I'm Ann Gary. I'm the chief strategy officer and one of the lead scientists at the Natural Capital Project. And I'll be moderating the session today. We're gonna start with um, examples of resilience from Michelle Lee, from Jamila and from Maya. And then Belinda is gonna talk about her work on the uh, review. Then uh, Michelle Lee will be talking about resilience approaches, changing the way we do development. Linda will then wrap things up and then we will have a uh, half an hour for discussion. So please start thinking about your questions and you're also welcome to use the um, Q&A, um, which we will get to in a second. So next slide. questions, that would be great. And I can incorporate them into our discussion. And we have lost your audio. At this point, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And if you have technical issues, 
please contact the event technical team through your chat box. We seem to have lost Anne, so I wonder then if uh, we should just get speaking um, and wait and hope she joins us um, as we go, as, if that's okay with you, Laurie? Yes, please, Belinda and team. Thank okay. you so much. Great. Okay, so it's wonderful to be here. Um, we're all going to turn on our videos now, so you can see there are some faces behind these voices. I see Anne has rejoined us. Anne, we just took over your job, and I'm now going to hand over to Jamila sitting in Stockholm, who's going to kick off this conversation with a few introductory remarks. Actually, we're, we're spicing things up here already. And um, well, first of all, you can hear me okay still? Yeah, okay, great. Thanks, Belinda. Um, we just thought we'd actually start with a question to see if we could start a, uh, again recognizing this is intended to be a conversation um, to start with a question to all of you online listening. We see a few familiar names, but lots of new ones as well. And so we're curious about you and the work that you're bringing into this conversation. And so we just thought we'd start with a uh, kind of an open question about are you are there questions that you're sitting with about resilience? It's not that we think the four of us have all of the answers necessarily. But what we're hoping to do then is if we can just hold them in our minds, then maybe they're things we can bring out and try to weave into the conversation as we as we go through the, the discussion today. So I don't know if you want to put them in the chat box um, or if you just want to unmute your microphone and, and shout out a question. But I think it would be really nice to just hear from, from all of you online. Maybe we can. I think the only option is the Q&A box. I don't think participants okay. have the option to unmute. So unless I'm okay. wrong, please just oh, go ahead and use the Q&A box and we can read those. I'll just give people a minute. And don't worry if there aren't any, we can, of course, endlessly fill the time talking about resilience. <laughs> and we're happy to do so, but we wanted to hear from you first. So we'll just give you a minute. Mm, okay, so we have one from Neil, interested in the importance of social capital and collaboration and conflict, um, in tra conflict transformation, sorry, in resilience. So if peace is more than the absence of violence, resilience should be more than the ability to withstand crisis. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I think, Jamila, you'll get right into that early. So thank you, Neil. Yeah, one for them in the Q&A, thinking about resilience metrics. Yes, always a question. <laughs> and wondering what recent advancements in this area interest you most. Great. Yeah, that's definitely going to come come up. Um, and we'll try to focus on that a little bit near the end, Allison. Uh, I'm curious if there are examples of government departments and agencies interacting and purposefully interacting with the resilience principles. Um, and then, of course, the gaps and barriers to actually using those in, in practice. Thanks. And then a nice general resilience research in COP27. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a, that's probably a whole other hour, but um, certainly. Oh, great. A former master's student, I, Nicole. Um, great. Working on spatial analyses of ecosystem services. Oh, wonderful. Continuing the resilience tradition. That's wonderful. 
Great. Well, please. Um, oh, and here's another one just before I, I close here. How should development economists and practitioners be thinking about resilience in the context of the twin goals of development and climate resilience? Yeah, that's that's a real challenge. Challenge. Again, we don't necessarily have all the answers, but we'll I'll try and weave that in um, in in my piece a little bit. And what we what what can you take away from from what we'll be talking about? Super. Well, please feel free to keep popping those into the into the Q and A box and into the chat box. And um, and in the meantime, I'll hand it over to Jamila to at least get us started for now. Yeah. Thank you, Shelley. And uh, really nice to be engaging with everyone and already these um, really important questions and comments. And Belinda, could you? Is it Belinda who's sharing the slide? Slides. You yeah. be able to pull up the slides, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll just speak for a couple of minutes about the motivation behind the review, which um, we started as part of the grade program at the Stockholm Resilience Center, which was the program for the, the official name was Guidance for Resilience in the Anthropocene Investments for Development, which was funded by the Swedish International Development Agency. And the main goal uh, of the program was to bridge worlds of resilience thinking and development practice. And I think this um, program and this quest also sits close to home for me, who before I became a resilience scholar, I guess I would just say, um, I worked within development in Afghanistan, which was one of the most highly funded uh, development, uh, international development programs. Um, and in 2010, 2011, all of a sudden, resilience was just popping up everywhere and kind of replacing sustainable livelihoods and uh, became resilient livelihoods, which at, at worst, you know, resilience risks then becoming um, a buzzword, which was also already brought up, um, or, um, or being really narrowly measured. Um, so within this, this review, we kind of also then thought back, um, what, what has, how has resilience been incorporated into development programming, um, especially 10 years on from the SDGs and looking at, at seeing an end to programs like BRACE, um, for example, which, um, was a, a, another large investment looking at building resilience and adaptation to climate extremes and disasters as one example, um, and kind of taking stock at how resilience has been incorporated um, into these programs, but also the relational aspect of um, what can we learn from um, a sustainable development practice. And so we also then define, I guess, just to, to set the scene there, um, sustainable development um, uh, like more, more broadly, I think <laughs> this is just a, an, an image of some of the many resilience investments um, that uh, that that have taken place over the over the past ten years. Um, at housed also at the Resilience uh, Center now is the GRP Global Resilience Partnership, um, which is also in partner with many of these these organizations. Um, so this was yeah part of the the motivation of of the review and when we're looking at um sustainable we're looking at sustainable development within kind of the uh, agenda 30 uh, con uh 2030 context so looking also beyond um a more narrow definition of what international development has been so that was looking at yeah, has, has resilience changed anything? How has it been reshaping development practice and policy towards more sustainable futures? Um and does help helping engage and understanding resilience from a complex and dynamic systems perspective help us do that? Um, and can we actually differentiate within these programs um, a resilience approach to um, this a, a business as usual sustainable development approach? Belinda, so if you could change the the next slide. Um, this is also to recognize that there's a plurality of resilience um, definitions and approaches. Um, I like to use the word, uh, or sorry, the term also resilience multiples and acknowledging that um, resilience is also um, co context and, and place specific, but, and also has its, its own, its own um, histories from different fields. And so these are just um, two examples of the plurality of how resilience um, is used within um, the sustainable development um, context. Um, and Belinda, if you could just go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, this is to situate how we uh, approached resilience within this, this uh, 
paper, but I would say also more broadly. Um, so within the context of complex adaptive systems, which we understand as um, uh, Maya is going to speak a bit more about this. I'm actually just setting the scene for her. <laughs> um, diverse interactions, dynamic, and having emergent behaviors. Um, and that social ecological systems are one type of complex adaptive system um, where, where there are inter um, many interdependencies between society and nature. Humans are in nature and taking a sustainability perspective. And it's within this context that we understand resilience as the capacity to absorb, adapt, and or transform. So indeed, it's this broader capacity to deal with change um, often in the event of, um, of, of a surprise or a shock, but not only. Um, and so goes goes far beyond the more narrow definition of resilience as an absorptive um, capacity, which is um, yeah one of the ways that it, it's popularly used. Um, but Maya, I'll hand over to you to give a bit more context about our complex adaptive systems approach to the review. Thank you, Jamal, and uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm just going to say a few words about the conceptual framework that underlies this review, but our work uh, also more in general. So resilience thinking is really grounded in a complexity perspective that, that, is a v that views social ecological systems as complex adaptive systems of humans embedded in the biosphere, as Jamal just said. And such a perspective really represents a mind shift in how we understand actually the nature of the world. And that really has implications for both how we study, but also how we intervene or act in social ecological systems. Enrica Preister um, from South Africa and colleagues, also from the Stockholm Resilience Center, have distilled kind of a set of six organizing principles. Could you switch the slide, Belinda? The next one, please. That, um, so these principles that kind of distinguish such, such complex adaptive systems from more mechanical systems that can also be studied following Newtonian principles of worldview. So as Jamila said for resilience, there's also multiple perspectives on um, complexity. Um, and we found this particular um, perspective useful for understanding how resilience thinking reshapes development and research, research and action. Um, but it is important to note kind of the plurality of different views of complexity. Um, so the first principle acknowledges the adaptive nature of living systems. So complex adaptive systems um, have adaptive capacities. That means they self-organize um, and co-evolve. Evolve. So they respond to con contextual changes and the practices, knowledges, and values, and biophysical environment kind of mutually influence each other and mutually shape each other in kind of this evolving process. Most importantly, they're, they are constituted through relations. So they are determined more by relationships than part. Um, so it's really the relations between elements and how they are organized that determines how the system behaves. Um, these are relations that are prior to the parts um, or the objects, and they define what, they actually also define what these objects are. So this really shifts the focus on relations away from like individual actors or objects. They're radically open, meaning there are no really set boundaries. It's rather, the, the boundaries are rather defined by the activity of the system in relation to its environment. Um, so that really means that we, we draw the boundaries um, like more in our analytical process. Um, so we need to be reflexive in how we draw them and what they mean and encompass. They're dynamic, this is the fourth one. Um, so they constantly change and this change is often non-linear. It can be abrupt such in regime shifts. Um, feedbacks and path dependency are really fundamental processes that shape the behavior of these systems. Um, so we can't study them through representation, representation of kind of linear cause-effect relationships, for example, which is often the case. They're contextually determined. That's probably one of the principles that's, that is most kind of known and highlighted for social ecological systems. So processes and functions are contingent on context. And finally, they are characterized by complex causality um, and emergence. So that means they actually 
cannot by, be understood by an, analyzing just the parts alone. So acknowledging this complex causation really entails that we have to deal with multiple causes across spatial and temporal scales, that we need to account for these feedbacks that shape these dynamic processes. Um, we need to deal with novelty and surprise or uncertainty, um, uncertainty about, for example, how processes evolve and consider kind of the co-evolution um, of phenomena through kind of intertwined social and ecological processes. So this complexity or this complex adaptive systems framing really underlies the six shifts in practice that um, Belinda now is gonna <laughs> further elaborate on um, that we think are better, help, help us to better engage in complex contexts. So I'll hand over to you, Belinda. Thanks, Maya. Um, and thanks to all of you you participants for joining and being part of this conversation and to Anne for setting us up. So as Jamila was saying, you know, we were really interested um, as part of this, this program to, to look at how is, I mean, and I think many of you on this call too will be interested in how is our science being used? How is the science of resilience being put into the practice of de development? And as Jamila said, that's development interpreted in its broadest sense. That includes sustainable development, national development, international development, and even economic development. Um, and how are these um, enterprises and practices of development using the concept of resilience? But more specifically, we wanted to look at whether the use of resilience is helping to fundamentally reorient or reshape development to better engage with today's realities. So this notion of development has been around for more than 70 years now. And um, we, we really know that there are multiple calls for development to move beyond its conventional approaches and its origins, which were focused on you know, development and economic growth, or even sustainable development that was introduced in the 70s as the idea of growth that still minimizes environmental impacts. And today we see more and more this, this notion of these three pillars of sustainable development of the social, the economic and the environmental aspects of development. And, you know, I think that within the resilience world, we're also looking at um, moving development beyond that notion of these three rather static pillars into a development practice that is able to engage in the uncertain, the dynamic and the hyper-connected context in which development happens today. The world is a very different place from what it was in the 1950s and 1970s when these development practices um, were developed and became so entrenched. So basically we were asking when you put resilience into practice, is that practice or action distinguishable from mainstream or conventional sustainable development practice? And so to answer that question, we framed our review around what we called the six shifts in practice that we would hope to see or that we think are needed if one is now starting to move from more conventional approaches to development to development that fundamentally engages with the dynamic and complex contexts of um, current times. And so Maya has introduced us to the six key features um, or a set of key features of complex adaptive systems. And from each of these, we could then um, develop a shift from what we saw as the current mainstream focus of development effort to where that focus needs to shift towards innovative approaches able to account for complex system dynamics. So in the paper that we reference um, here and on the website where you registered, we go into these shifts in more detail and I don't wanna take the whole of um, this evening or today's uh, time to go into them. But very briefly, I'm just going to describe them and then try and give some examples. So at least you, you can have a grasp of what we're talking about. And so shift one acknowledges that the dynamic nature of development moves us away from this focus on the productive base of development of natural capital, of financial capital, of social and other capitals that are important for to development and more towards an understanding of the dynamic capacities that shape responses to change. And we know that capitals or assets matter, but only in as much as they create the ability to respond to change. And they've been found to be very poor proxies of capacities. 
And so this is a shift I think that many of us are undertaking in our work in moving from a more static asset based focus in our work to an, a work that looks at what are the dynamic adaptive um, capacities that exist in ecosystems and in society that allow us to be able to respond to changes. The second shift is the one um, that my introduced us to this need to focus on relationships. And so we really want to move away from the tendency that even something as amazing as the SDGs have of breaking systems apart into their social, their environmental and their economic components in order to understand the system, because we know that the whole of the system re um, responds and behaves differently to the sum of its parts. And so the focus here is arguing rather for a focus on what connects the parts, the relationships that actually determine the behavior and that shape the context um, and the sustainable development of those contexts in which we work. The third shift um, is exploring the challenges of defining boundaries for systems in which we work, whether that's as researchers or as practitioners, and the risk that we take whenever we define a system boundary that we are excluding an important factor that's external to the system, or that we're ignoring some of these really important cross-scale dynamics that are shaping contexts in very important ways um, in contemporary times, especially as the world becomes more globally interconnected. So here the shift isn't saying do away with boundaries, but it is about away from treating boundaries as static to approaches that are able to see boundaries as dynamic, porous, and in need of constant review in collaboration by those who are involved and affected by the boundary decisions and choices. The fourth shift um, is one that might be familiar to many of you. We're also arguing for a shift away from a focus on static and often short-term outcomes and targets to rather focus on the process of sustainable development and how different development pathways emerge and are maintained or are shifted. This isn't that we're saying outcomes and targets aren't important, but we move away from viewing them as fixed endpoints to recognizing how outcomes themselves are shaped and actually shape the processes of sustainable development. In the fifth shift, uh, we build on from many in this development space who caution against the use of blueprints and generic interventions to recognize the importance of context. But we go beyond the notion of context as idiosyncratic to acknowledge how the behaviors that are relevant to sustainable development often emerge from recognizable patterns of dynamic interactions that shape and are shaped by context. So this shift to context sensitivity and the interplay between context and intervention enables us to ask questions such as what about context can be generalized for context sensitive interventions and a move towards understanding the types of interventions that might work in relationship to certain types of contexts. In the sixth and final shift, we, which actually pulls a lot of the other shifts together, we really um, explore this idea that many of us are challenged by a search for effective interventions to bring about desired outcomes. That's what underpins a lot of our work. But that search for effective interventions is actually founded on many assumptions that are often quite hidden and not explored. And many of them, when you look to them, are actually based on quite a linear cause effect logic leading to assumptions such as this input or this impact that I have has resulted in this particular output, which results in this particular outcome, which we know is not the way systems work, because it ignores, as Maya said, the, the complex causality of cause-effect relationships, such as the cross-scale interactions, such as recursive causal pathways, ways where an effect may feed back on a cause and cause and effect become entangled um, where we have to learn to deal with novelty and unexpectedness and uncertainty as processes evolve. And so the shift to complex causality means that projects that aim to strengthen something like resilience need to actually be embedded themselves and shaped by the processes of development rather than external to those processes. And this is quite a different model of doing development. <clears throat> So what we did then is with these shifts, which we'll also happily explore in a bit more detail in the discussion session, we looked across all these programs and projects that we engaged with during this large resilience and development project at the Stockholm Resilience Center, many of which were coming to an end after 10 years of substantial investments in building or um, 
increasing or enhancing resilience. Oh, sorry, wrong, wrong slide. But as you can all imagine, when you type in the words resilience and development to see how much work and how many projects you might find, the answers are tens of thousands of articles that have the words resilience and development, even just in the title. And so we actually were reliant on what we call a review of reviews. We were very fortunate that many of these large investments were coming to an end and were publishing large evaluation reports, um, <clears throat> large stories and um, narratives on the work that they'd done, big meta evaluations done by consultants employed to look across those programs. And at the same time, we were seeing a lot of systematic reviews going on in the scientific literature, looking at things like adaptation interventions and the use of resilience and whether they were working in developing countries. But then because we know that so much of the literature is dominated by the global north and by more global examples, we specifically went and looked for examples of work that we knew was happening in parts of the world, such as Southeast Asia and parts of, of Africa too. And so we're able to find smaller, still reviews of case studies operating at quite specific um, small scales like this one here in Northern Namibia. Um, and so we, we were working very hard to get quite a representative sample of the scientific and practical and policy and geographic um, uh, scope of the work on the use of resilience in development. And then across all of these six shifts, we reviewed each of these documents looking to track progress made in each of the six shifts. Um, and sorry, what we then did was, um, I'm going to hand over to Michelle Lee just now to take you through some of the larger findings. But what I can say is across each of those shifts, we found fantastic examples of exciting evidence of practice and very practical approaches, new methods, um, and new work going on of putting these very complex and quite theoretical ideas that you're being introduced to in the session into um, very realistic, but also very innovative practices. And just here on the slide, I've got an example that was work on building relational resilience on family farms um, with some fantastic ideas around the measurement aspects, as um, someone was asking in the question session. There was also work that we found produced by global scholars um, from the Global South working on violence in Zimbabwe and more relational approaches to building resilience in those cases and publishing an entire book in this case. There was great work by large programs like Oxfam doing the shift from the capitals to capacities, um, really highlighting the need to focus on the absorptive, adaptive and transformative capacities underlying a lot of um, resilience in their work. And then there were even examples of shift six, which um, is quite a difficult one to wrap one's head around. But for example, Mercy Corps in their work on gender norms and intra-household change have actually moved from the, the original sort of more linear theories of change to be able to bring up what they are calling these complex resilience causal chains of tracing um, the, the recursive causal pathways involved in shaping um, gender norms at the household level in their work. And so we found these examples give one a lot of excitement and a lot of hope showing that these shifts are not only plausible, but they're actually imminently possible, resulting in very innovative practices um, that are clearly doing development differently in ways that have helped to engage in these complex and uncertain contexts in which many of us work. So I'm going to now pass over to Michelle Lee to see if there's any discussion and questions at this stage. Thanks, Michelle Lee. Yeah, thanks, Belinda. Um, so we just wanted to take a pause. We know that we've sort of been throwing a lot of jargon um, out into the, to the discussion. So we just wanted to pause here for a moment um, before we go into some of the overall findings um, beyond these kind of pockets of progress to see if there's any questions or any just clarifications um, that you that you're would like to ask. Um, so we'll just give you a moment for that. And I realize I can't see my chat box now. Oh, here we are. 
And seeing none, Belinda, did you for now? And but please feel free to pop them in. Um, Belinda, do you want to pull up the next slide? Um, yeah, one of and, the and just sorry, oh. Michelle, just to mention, I saw there was one question around references. We're definitely going to give a lot more material and a lot more references in this presentation and make those available as well online. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, great. Thanks. Great. Um, so if you want to pull up the next slide, Belinda, what I wanted to get into was some of the barriers and challenges that we found around actually trying to make these shifts in practice, as you can imagine, although we found these really innovative examples. And I, I see as Belinda pulled those up on the screen again, I, I get excited just thinking about some of those ones that we found. They were super interesting. Um, but of course, there's real challenges with with doing this work. And so, but I, I know a lot of you are are trying to do this work either in practice yourselves or working in partnership with groups that are trying to um, take other theories into practice. And so I'm just curious a little bit about, yeah, what what challenges and barriers you you're finding because I suspect some of them, you know, follow similar patterns to the kinds of things that we were finding in this in this resilience work. So I just wanted to kind of open it up and see if anybody had any initial reflections on sort of what the challenges and barriers are to operationalizing this kind of work. Okay, and, and sorry, and a question in between around uh, around any of the relational and complex causality theories that change integrate into policy strategies for development planning practice, especially in urban systems beyond project interventions. And Belinda, I don't know if you want to hop back in on the on the Mercy Corps work, the complex causal chains there, and um, whether that had ended up getting into actual policies or not. I mean, but that's that's a, that's a that's a good question. I think that we were seeing, seeing definite uptake in the policy level of development agencies themselves. Um, and for example, the work that we've um, had as a follow up to this work with groups like the African Resilience Framework or the UNDP's Human Development Report Office, we're seeing, you know, the work on relationality and complex causality, maybe not under those labels, but we're definitely seeing more of that um, in their policies. Uh, but I'm not sure if there's a specific set of policies that um, you'd like us to explore a bit more. Michelle, was there something you wanted to add in from, I didn't see the Mercy Corps work ending up at a policy level, but quite a lot of useful feedback from Mercy Corps to, for example, the policy frameworks of funders around some of the challenges of adopting a more complexity oriented perspective and how little time there is allowed for that in the design phase and the scoping phase of funded projects and working in these contexts. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking this, um, I'd have to pull it up now, right? <laughs> um, the Douthwaite work has, was also looking at using a complexity aware um, approach within some of the work that Australian Aid, I believe, was funding. Um, but I don't remember if it was specific to urban systems, which you're asking about. So I'd have to double check that for you, um, but a great question. But any other questions? Um, maybe we've stunned you into silence with all our jargon, but hopefully you'll have some, some questions or thoughts and reflections from your own work about the challenges and barriers to operationalizing this kind of work. Yeah, so the challenge of how you can influence future resilience funding and the scoping of a resilience ROI. Yeah, an ongoing question that we grapple with a lot. Obviously, um, as Jamila mentioned, the Secretariat of the Global Resilience Partnership um, is, is housed here, which is, I think it's over 60 agencies that are part of that partnership. So certainly trying to continue these kinds of conversations and share these kinds of lessons in, into that space as well. Um, with a with a and that partnership itself obviously representing a, a kind of an enormous amount of funding in terms of when when it's taken kind of in its totality um all of the partners themselves and the resilience programs they're investing in okay so if, if i don't see any others for now i'll I'll, uh, and again, please feel free to keep popping them in the chat or the Q&A, sorry, I should say. Um, and I will um, move into actually discussing these challenges and barriers. And Belinda, if you wanna hit the next um, 
bring up some of the text on the slide while I speak. One of the overall findings across, I would say all of the six shifts, but particularly the first three, so capitals to capacities, objects to thinking more in these relational dynamics terms and moving from very closed, uh, very small scale boundaries to thinking them at them as more open was that um, based on the initial description of the shifts that we would see, whether it was in the introduc introductory text of these large scale programs, or even in some of the research articles about specific projects or in initiatives, the language that was being used around how they were perhaps describing the need for resilience or what they were hoping, or even you know hypothesizing, I suppose, that using resilience would add into the initiatives that they were working on and the types of changes that need to take place in sustainable development practice. A lot of that discourse and language felt very, very familiar um, and very and and certainly mirrored resilient science literature. So it seemed quite aligned and 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 if I'm totally honest, some of it was certainly a, a, a better articulation in some ways more clear than I can do myself, certainly. And so that felt quite, you know, like, okay, we're all on the same page here. Um, but when we started to trace that through these large scale programs, you know, beyond the introductory text to actually what methods were being used, how they ended up funding um, that overall program, ended up funding certain projects and initiatives, what exactly ended up being measured again, um, Allison, you, you raised this issue around measurement it always comes up, right? So what exactly they were measuring and what was counting as impact um, and the metrics and numerous indicators that in there, in that work, there tended to be this real um, kind of reversion back to very object um, oriented capitals using assets as a proxy of some type of overall resilience capacity. Um, and I'll just, just as an example, I think one of one a common one that often um, comes up is to use the number of livestock per household, for instance, as a proxy for a broader capacity to adapt to some type of shock or stressor. Um, or there's been a lot of work now increasingly around social network analysis. So people looking at the number of relationships that an actor might have. So with the social capital of an actor, um, but then they're using that to sort of create this quantifiable number that's meant to represent, again, this like dynamic relationality that they've been describing in the introductory text. And so seeing a bit of a, a divergence there. Another last example is re resilience assessments are very common under these large programs. And a number of them obviously get published and I'm sure you've all heard about them. Um, and they're, they are very explicit about this issue around boundaries and this kind of, we, we were talking about one of these shifts needing to be moving from closed to more open um, systems. And I think there were often some fantastic participatory processes that were being tested and, and um, tried in practice to, to acknowledge that these boundaries are socially constructed and determined. But then once the, that, that process had taken place, then it still became a very fixed boundary. And so they weren't necessarily looking at the connections to other scales once the assessment started, which I think then ends up sort of missing and neglecting some of the explanatory power of those other cross-scale connections that could help explain some of the project outcomes. And I think this is happening despite resilient science, and I would say sustainability science more generally, actually having some very good tools um, and well-established methods to, to do that kind of work. So discourse, seeing some shifts, not necessarily seeing it play out in practice. And then unfortunately, I think, uh, although there were these really innovative practices, which Belinda um, mentioned and, and which we were really excited to find through this review process, it gave us a sense of, okay, maybe these shifts are really happening. I would say, in, as the evidence started to stack up, and again, we had these these large reviews of reviews, sort of these comparative studies of 34 different empirical cases of climate change adaptation resilience interventions, um, a systematic review, for instance, that had looked at about 276 different articles, um, one meta-analysis that was comparing across 87 different uh, studies. And what we were finding in those, and in, and in particular with these larger program investments, um, 
the the braced prime um, of tango, which Belinda and Jamila had mentioned, we're still seeing quite limited progress. So they're still very much dominated by a focus on capitals, on objects, linear assumptions about what will change, how it will change, when it will change. And I think in in do in in observing that, um, it seems that not only is there a divergence from where the practice is and, and what resilient science might indicate would be worth focusing on or would be worth measuring. So you're seeing that diverge. They're not, there isn't necessarily a following of that, but they're actually not even following each other. So everyone's creating their own frameworks. Everyone's creating their own definition of resilience. Everyone's creating their own indicators. Um, A.R. Cedar's work, which is mentioned on the side, slide here, um, has done a nice review around the, the huge number of indicators that are used around uh, adaptive um, capacities. And I think um, it gives a promise that all of these things are somehow about resilience, but then in practice, they're sticking with these very standard ways of doing development. And some of the scholars we were reviewing were arguing this is quite misleading and maybe even bordering on unethical to kind of repackage standard practices, but call it resilience. Um, which of course itself has been long studied and, and um, seen it's problematic already. So, so a little, you know, kind of a depressing finding that that's, this overall progress is quite limited, but perhaps personally, at least the most depressing was that there was work being shown by scholars um, like Lisa Shipper and Siri Erickson and others that, and, and they're looking particularly at resilience um, and interventions around climate change adaptation. And they were finding that it's not only that some of these initiatives aren't building resilience, that was a double negative, but so they're not building resilience, but in some cases they're actually eroding it and increasing vulnerability. And in that case, vulnerability to climate change. So if you're interested in, in some of that evidence, um, you can probably do a quick search around um, maladaptation. Um, and the work that's sort of emerging under that umbrella. So of course, not seeing a lot of progress, we're seeing a shift in the discourse, but not really carrying through in the, pro, um, in the actual practices and, and maybe in some instances actually even increasing vulnerability um, and eroding overall resilience that begs the question of why. And one of the most common themes refers to the barriers that we see around how the funding itself, how these portfolios of funds are actually designed, and then how the programs that respond to those funding calls um, are designed, and then how those are evaluated so that they can show accountability and impact to those funders. And I think addressing that barrier, it, it's, it's recognized as challenging because you can't actually resolve it just by collecting more data or simply tweaking a, a perhaps a, a method on the ground in a, in a, you know, at a small scale. But what uh, numerous scholars were pointing to is that there is this issue around the ways that conventional development practices themselves are embedded in paradigms, often associated with more reductionist approaches to science, um, reductionist approaches to sort of managerial science and planning approaches. And when you try to squeeze complex social ecological systems approaches to resilience into that, you can potentially compromise the science and the theory, or at least the potential benefits that that could have actually provided. And a colleague here, Tillman Hertz at the center, often talks about this in relationship to mainstreaming, which some of you may also um, come across in your work. So these large organizations that um, institute sort of an idea around mainstream, gender mainstreaming, meaning that all of the, the programs and then all the pro projects within those programs need to think about their work in relationship to, for instance, gender issues or climate change mainstreaming, or in this case, resilience mainstreaming. And as you, I'm sure we all know, when you simply try to apply, add in an idea and apply it using all the same ways that you were working before, um, again, you sort of end up maybe compromising the, poss the possibilities that could have come from doing something differently. So I'm just gonna, um, and I, I should just say also that I think the studies that we mentioned that were really showing progress in these shifts, those instances where we did see some progress, they were often describing these barriers 
and showing there are alternatives, right? And, and demonstrating those in practice that you can adopt a more process relational approach or a complexity aware perspective to sustainable development. So I'll just end on that point, um, which I've already mentioned is that the evidence, it does, there are these pockets of pro progress that show this, this, these shifts are very feasible already. There's a range of tools in resilient science itself um, that can help, but also that practitioners on the ground have been creating um, over a number of years now. But we did also observe that there are many other ways of knowing and, and doing and being that have been marginalized by the existing approaches to sustainable development that themselves represent a real form of capacity to engage in complex adaptive systems contexts. And many societies and indigenous ways of knowing and being have struggled to be heard for a long time. And I would say they were still not well represented or well recognized in the work that we were reviewing. I'm gonna pass it back now to you, Belinda. Thanks, Michelle Lee. And so I'm just going to do a, a quick wrap up and then hand over to Anne so we can get into the q and I see a lot of questions coming up in the, the box. And so we'll be answering those online as well as um, by typing if we don't manage to get to you. But I think, you know, to to then talk about this, um, these challenges and this progress, you know, the the shifts themselves are challenging. We found that they were plausible. They were ex there were examples of practice um, making several of the shifts. And in fact, we found that when you make progress in one shift, you often bring along progress in many other shifts, that the progress and the shifts themselves are intertwined. So by adopting more relational approaches, it becomes easier to, to see the dynamic processes that are, are involved. And it, it obviously is also then underpinned by a, a richer understanding of the complex causality in that system. And so we, we found this a little, you know, after all the sort of challenges and barriers, um, we did find it a, a nice positive spot that even very small programs with very small pots of funding were able to make significant progress across multiple of these shifts because of how the shifts enable each other. Um, we also found in those little pockets of practice that where the shift was actually being made, um, we were actually seeing several of the long-standing tensions in sustainable development being resolved. So for example, there's um, you know been a long challenge between understanding whether it's social capital that matters or natural capital that matters. And a focus on relationships really takes away that tension between the social and the ecological because one focuses on what connects them. Similarly, the, the long-standing tension between bottom-up and top-down approaches becomes a lot easier to resolve when we acknowledge how open these systems are and how important the cross-scale dynamics and external factors are. And so I think not only did we see exciting pockets of practice, we saw good examples of shifts bringing along other shifts and also how um, by implementing these shifts, many of these um, existing challenges in sustainable development can be actively resolved. <clears throat> but I think that what we wanted to do in this conversation um, is also to engage with all of you and your experiences of reflecting on, you know, how do science and practice actively meet? There was no intention in doing this paper of this or this review of this being a critique of practice, you know, as if practice isn't able to use all this great science and all these useful ideas and theories that scientists are generating. But actually we were asking of ourselves as scientists who also um, have worked with practice in the space, you know, why are these shifts not happening everywhere? Um, you know, we can see some of these challenges on the side of practice, but what is it that science needs to do differently in order to mobilize um, and gain momentum in multiple of these shifts? And so I think we're all having um, follow-up experiences <clears throat> after having done all this work on grade and on this review, as we engage with different groups who want to hear more about these shifts and how, how to implement it in the work that they're doing, which is really challenging us to think differently about the research that we do <clears throat> the, and the kinds of research that we're actually delivering in the space of resilience. 
And so I just wanted to put up one more slide before we start the discussion, which is that many have asked for references. This review article is available open access at the following link. Um, we also have more popular um, magazine type articles available at this next link on rethink.earth. And then we actually have a great set of videos that explore several of these shifts in more detail, not just from the perspective of scientists, but actually from the perspective of some of the practitioners that we met along the way um, and engaged with around some of these shifts. And those videos are all available on the Stockholm Resilience Center's website as well. And I'm sure with Laurie, we can make sure we share these links with you if you can't scribble them down now quickly from your screen. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Anne. Thanks. I'm going to be really bold and try to turn it on my camera. Hopefully I won't disappear again. Belinda, you might have been right about the internet at the moment, although I seem kind of blurry. Um, thank you so much for really fascinating and thought-provoking comments from you. I don't want to talk much because we have three questions in the Q&A, but I, I did want to pick up one thing that you were just talking about, Belinda, in terms of really highlighting for a paradigm shift and way deeper thinking about that gap between brilliant science and practice and need for a paradigm shift in all of those six different dimensions. And I'm about that connection between shifts. So affecting a shift in two of those can help bring along the others. I'm wondering if you have other practical ideas for how we can affect change so that we can Oh no, did we lose Anne? <clears throat> I think she was too brave in putting her video on. So I think I'll just um, repeat the question in case some of you uh, didn't hear it. And also just to double check with others that I heard the question correctly because it went in and out. So, so really looking at you know the points Michelle Lee was raising around sort of the deeper um, philosophical and methodological orientations where we find these compromises being made um, because the complexity paradigm doesn't fit well with the reductionist paradigm of funding, for example, and how we change paradigms, which is like a million dollar question. And I'm going to hand over to Michelle to just give us some thoughts on, on that <laughs> in, in that work that she was presenting. And then also um, amongst Jamila, myself and Maya, I'm sure we can add a few thoughts as we keep track of the Q&A box as well. Thanks. <laughs> I think it was a bad idea for me to turn on my video. So I'll keep it up. I'll let you all, uh, sounds like you're moderating yourself. So maybe I'll just stay out of it since I'm one reliable. That's okay. Thanks, Anne. We, I think Belinda had just sort of um, lobbed your question at me <laughs> around these sort of how, I mean, if I, if I understood it correctly, was how do we actually you know, if the challenge is these kind of paradigms, how do we actually start to shift them then? And how do we grapple with that? And I think, it, you know, one of the references that I've mentioned, the Douthwaite et al. paper, was a really fascinating read of how they had, they had um, inside their own agency had been granted, okay, we'll carve out a little pot of money to try this more complexity aware approach. And I think they got two years in and were sort of constantly being faced with, okay, but how can you show us impact? Like, what is it that you're trying to do? And they were really trying to challenge that narrative even that it's supposed to be this fast measurable um, thing. And especially when you're trying to do something completely new and different, obviously that's gonna, gonna take more than you can report on in, in one year or two year. But yet their whole system is set up so that you can report each year. And so they were really um, getting a lot of pushback even internally in their organization about the work that they were trying to do around this. And then eventually, and I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have it up in front of me, so I'm, I'm not going to get the numbers right exactly, but it was only a few years into it when their funding um, became, was cut. Um, 
maybe not not so surprising to those of us who are trying to do this work um, because it does challenge the system. But I think it was just a really, they have a really nice discussion in there about the very challenge of even within a single organization, never mind talking about, you know, practice writ large or across a number of different agencies that might be working in these spaces, but just even within one organization, the challenge of trying to navigate that, um, the very real pushback that can come when you start trying to transform certain um, aspects of development. Um, so I don't think there's easy answers around that. Um, but again, as we said, there there were exam there were examples of people doing this, um, and and which are published and which we we reference in this paper. And so I think there are these. But again, we we refer to them as pockets because they're small. You know, they're it's not the mainstream and it's not um, widely known. And it took us going through this extensive review ourselves and and working in this area for several years before we're even coming across them. Um, so they're certainly not the mainstream way of doing things. And I think it will remain an ongoing challenge. Um, to do that kind of work. Of course, there's a bigger discussion about how you transform systems writ large, which I could probably go on endlessly about, but I'll just pause there and see if anyone else wants to jump in. Well, I guess just to add, I think if I also heard the rest of the question, and I'm not sure, but um, about the kind of different leverage points to that paradigm change and the interrelation or intertwinedness also as one a question just came up as, came up as well on the shift. Um, and I, if I'm, I'm now kind of looking at also some of the questions to 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 link this a little bit about how this um, the framework or the framing that we used could also be used in other contexts that aren't development contexts. And um, I would say absolutely. I mean, it's a very, gen it, you know, we framed it around progress within um, uh, development, but it can be, I think, it can be used much more quite uh, broadly than that. But um, which would be interesting to to think and chat more about and hear more from from some of you about. But just to say, I think that it's a really interesting thing to also look at where to intervene. And I think there would be different questions around that. So it could be like where there are shifts happening. That could be an easy entry or an easier entry point. Um, so if it is um, capacities over capital, for example, and then kind of getting at some of the stickier ones like the relations um, and how you could kind of um, yeah, look at the interlinkages between the shifts, um, I think would be, yeah, another way to kind of look at um, paradigm change from kind of a leverage points perspective of what would be the easiest entry point to uh, leverage point to enter on and how could that transcend across some of the other shifts would be cool to think about more. <laughs> And perhaps, Anne, I mean, I think Donella Meadows, who writes so beautifully about system change, talks about how easy it is to change an individual's paradigm, because as soon as you see the world differently, you don't need any more convincing, but that institutional paradigms are some of the most <laughs> um, inflexible and hardest to change. But I think there's also this point to be argued that we're not trying to argue that there's only one paradigm or that there's a right paradigm. And in fact, Michelle Lee makes this point that in some ways, resilient science is Western science's way of coming to recognize the non-reductionist um, and, and more complexity-oriented perspectives on the world that many other groups and scholars and communities have had for a, lo a long time. And so I'm seeing in places like the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which has been very thoughtful about their engaging with other paradigms and other knowledge systems, has actually been able to navigate and increase people's awareness of the existence of paradigms and even their own paradigms, but also the plural paradigms that are involved in efforts to do sustainable development or conserve biodiversity or whatever the initiative is that you're involved in. And I think that Donella Meadows writes beautifully about that ability to be agile in our own um, ability to see others' paradigms and also to be recognizing when we're getting entrenched in our own. Um, and that can be, I think, quite useful because I don't think any of us who wrote this paper or who are in this conversation want to say that this is the way to understand resilience or this is the way to do sustainable development. We were just looking at these significant investments that have been made in resilience and, and trying to tease out where there might be innovative practices that are actually better able to grapple with some of these turbulent times. I yeah, thanks, Belinda. Building on that a little bit, 
Oh. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about if if there are people who are listening, for example, who have different definitions of resilience than you do, how might your work apply to them? Like how how do those plural definitions of resilience play into the need for a paradigm shift and and sort of allow us to make progress here. Yeah, and that's actually one we were talking a little bit about as we were preparing for this conversation. I know Jamila has some thoughts on this topic on the plethora of resilience frameworks. So I'm keen to hear what she has to say. And then Michelle Lee also, I mean, in parts of the review, we, we saw some of the challenges of the plethora of frameworks and indicators and measures. I wonder, maybe Jamila can talk a bit and then you could talk a little bit to those challenges. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I guess um, just start by saying the importance of recognizing plurality and then linking it also to context sensitivity shift that we mentioned um, and that recognizing and embracing or like resilience multiples or plurality of resilience doesn't mean that you can use it in any way at any time without um, specificity for that context. So it still means any time that we define it within oops, sorry, a project context or um, uh, an academic context or whether it's to be assessed or to measured, um, there's rigor involved in defining what that means in a context specific um, place. Um, while also embracing the vernacular, there's been interesting work coming out of um, what was the STEP Center on uh, vernacular definitions of resilience uh, in different languages and cultures, um, which I think would be really interesting to incorporate more, especially into development um, programming. Um, but then again, yeah, on the flip side, and maybe just then handing over to you, Michelle Lee, the, um, the risk of, um, of resilience being um, defined very narrowly in the sense of maintaining a status quo, which is how it does often end up being used, um, which again, it's, it's, not, um, it's not wrong to use resilience in, in that way and it's potentially useful to measure it in specific contexts. But if that's the only way that resilience is being used in terms of um, kind of the types of system and paradigm shape change that we need to be, that uh, we need to see, then it can become problematic. Um, that, yeah, those yeah. are a couple of thoughts on that. Yeah, it's such an important question, and I, I, we, we have thought a lot about this, and it was certainly something that was a very real part of our experience in the grade program, and as a knowledge partner to this, this global resilience partnership, because there, you know, every organization that comes in as a partner does have its own, um, and I think there's even a sense of that they don't even necessarily, you know, as individuals coming into that space, they don't feel like they have sort of the agency to like completely change the definition being that's being direct that the funding is directed towards because that's almost like changing your mandate at an organizational level. Like this is how they've defined it and this is how they've invested the money. So there's no kind of changing that now. And so I think, but they sort of hung on to them in sort of a in a in a way that could be, again, as, as Jamel is saying, you know, it'd be one thing if they were doing it because it was context sensitive. So you have this plethora of different ways of approaching it because you're thinking about how it, you can make meaning in these different places. But that wasn't actually what a lot of this review found is happening, right? And instead, it's actually just like people creating their own and kind of doing their own thing. And I think, interestingly, this complex adaptive systems approach to social ecological systems resilience at least in our experience, has actually been a place where people start feeling like they can see how they fit in then, right? So that everyone was kind of off being protective of their own um, version of resilience, but then actually starting to see how this framing around thinking about co complexity, it actually ended up being a really powerful framing, at least in our engagement in the Global Resilience Partnership, of how to actually start thinking about bringing this resilience work together. So I think it it does hold a lot of promise, um, and maybe even creates a maybe a new opportunity space to start bringing together things that were, you know, previously although all called the same thing, quite siloed and quite different. So along kind of the the same lines, if I might add just to that briefly, as I'm engaging critically yeah, with different views, um, 
can also really foster reflexivity by like pointing towards blind spots or kind of raising new open questions that if you stick within one view will go um, unnoticed, for example. Great, thank you. Let's turn to um, some questions from our Q&A box. Um, I and think I see this, we should... This, sorry, I, I was just yeah. gonna say, I see there are a couple of questions in the Q&A box that we could speak to a little bit in more detail. Um, and I did wanna say, you know, there are lots of people asking for specific examples. And because this is a review, we can't actually lift out all these wonderful examples, but we do actually have the list of all 40 of the, the documents they provided in the review. And, you know, so there is a traceability there of people. I see there's a question around the role of local capacities and citizens and, and local government. And there was a fantastic example in the city of Cape Town of using a more relational approach to look at how knowledge around early warning systems in the climate change space actually moved between um, citizens and between citizens and local government, um, showing that it isn't just really the asset of information that is um, what helps in the case of a disaster, but actually in how networked and how those information flows and the capacities to access that information. So I think there will are some nice examples um, for people asking questions around that. And Alison and a few others have asked the good old question about resilience metrics. And I'm happy to take a first stab at that one. You know, I mean, Alison, as you yourself as an expert in the space of resilience assessment and measurement, no, this isn't an easy one to, to, um, to say that there's a simple answer to. I think what we did found were quite innovative approaches to the challenge of measurements. As Michelle Lee says, so much of this measurement is kind of a forced evaluation for forced accountability. And not that we're saying accountability shouldn't happen, um, but it is a little bit of the, the tail wagging the dog in many of these cases. But we did find fantastic indicators of um, more relational aspects around um, relational approaches to resilience. Uh, there was, for example, the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund, who actually didn't measure resilience, but looked at it as a means to human well-being ends that they then did measure. So I think we were seeing quite um, innovative ways of exploring resilience with a, a, a complexity lens um, and not always moving into the space where development tends to go of measuring resilience as an outcome in itself. And so there are a couple of those examples. We have actually some case studies and reviews of community monitoring systems and indigenous um, scholars and indigenous community monitoring systems too that are using very different approaches to measure what we would call resilience, um, but that they have different names for in more relational ways. So I think we were excited by those. You know, I certainly don't have the answer that says, you know, he has the secret measurement for resilience that everyone can use. Um, but I do think it was about what about acknowledging the complexity and the dynamics and the core features of this context. What do they tell me about what I need to measure to be able to ensure that the changes that are happening are the ones that I'm tracking and, and learning from. Michelle Lee, Jamila, any thoughts to add to the metrics, resilient metrics challenge? No, Maya? <laughs> so I think this is the challenge that comes back to us, right? When, as I was saying, um, Anne as well, that, you know, this isn't only about what practice needs to do to use resilient science, but what scientists need to be doing in order to provide some of these answers to the measurement challenge or the accountability challenge. Uh, there was a recent publication of, on evaluation in complex contexts that were showing some, some great innovations in that space. So there certainly are examples that one can point to, but that wasn't resilient specifically, that was just around evaluation in complex and dynamic contexts. And are there other questions coming up? Yeah, I think it would be great if you could try this one. 
any of you, what would success of operationalized resilience thinking look like with respect to capacities of local governments and with respect to citizens? Do you, I'm not sure if I totally understand the question. Is it, do you, is, does the person mean, um, you know, what, what capacities do local governments need? in their interactions with citizens that would reflect some sort of resilience in the system. I'm not sure if I totally understand the question. Sorry, if the Zenot. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, um, Zenot could um, add to the Q&A here, but I was just thinking about the, what would success look like in terms of building capacity in local governments and or in citizens like what what does it mean to have without getting away from the metrics question a little bit but what what does success look like without having to come up with something that's measurable like what is what is the vision for success in development having a uh, operationalized sort of, imagine you've made this these six shifts what does it look like for local governments and for their citizens Michelle do you want to sorry I wasn't sure if you were talking I'll, I'll just say something more general and then get you to get uh, specific because it's kind of bridging off of what you were saying, Belinda, in just the sense of um, the measurability of things. And I think also within science, we struggle with a lot of this, like taking a relational approach to empirical data is really difficult and it requires taking a relational approach from the beginning. And that um, is a bit um, related to also these, these questions of spheres of influence within policy. And I mean, that we work at very different speeds. I think that was um, an issue that we faced within the program uh, at the Resilience Center at the time as well, that um, co-development with um, different government agencies, civil society and researchers, there's, I mean, I'm sure probably everyone on this call struggles with this, but that there's these different, um, different demands. And as a qualitative researcher, that's something that I really struggle with a lot is this need for metrics and measurement. And this is going a little bit into this question then of often, um, so in some like deeply qualitative material I'm working with right now, it's to have a good life. Like that's when looking at what resilience is, that's often the response. It means to, to have the freedom to do what I want to do in order to have a good life for example, and that's not something that can be given a metric. And as soon as you give it a metric, you lose the some of these shifts that we actually talked about. So one of the like meta shifts that I think would be great to see within whether it's development or science or somewhere generally would be more value of these qualitative ways of assessing um, that go away from the need for, for such metrics. But yeah, so I don't know if you have something more specific to say on the well, Michelle, I was wondering, you know, your work on looking at what capacities have been built through the fellowship programs you've been involved in. Um, and, you know, I think in, in that example, I don't know if I'm understanding the question correctly in terms of what success would look like, but what what are we finding in terms of what are the important capacities um, at whatever scale we're working at um, that allow for um, adaptation or transformation under certain circumstances. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things would be, you know, success would be don't create any more <laughs> different indicators <laughs> would be a really practical one, which I think most governments are going to try and do when they create a strategy around resilience, right? Um, but actually just start thinking about how we can build off of and learn from all of the existing work that's there. But um, to the point that Belinda raises, I mean, one of the things and I think we saw this in a lot of the review um, and others have documented very well is when we're talking about these capacities. There's this whole mixing of, of um, the different kinds of capacities. So that absorptive capacity or that capacity to ensure a system persists, the capacity to adapt, the capacity to transform. They're very distinct. 
And transformation and adaptation are very distinct kinds of change in a complex adaptive system um, that are going to follow different trajectories and different patterns. And so I think this mixing of, well, this group calls this an adaptive adaptive capacity and this group calls it absorptive and this group over here is calling it transformative i think that's you know part of the problem is then we, it's very difficult to learn and compare across because everyone's sort of mixing and and jumbling these up but also and some of some research uh, published back in 2012 actually so a while ago now by nadine marshall and others um was showing that, and, and this was a very small scale study on peanut farmers in Australia, so take it for what you will, there's only so much we can generalize it. But it was one of the first studies I came across that showed actually the capacities to adapt were hindering the capacities to transform in that particular context. We still don't know enough about, about how those interplay and whether there is a, you know, I don't think all of them hinder each other, but you know, what is it that um, is a capacity to adapt and what is it, what is a distinct capacity to transform? And Allison, who's on the call, and I have done some work around trying to trying to synthesize the literature around that. And I think some of these capacities um, are actually as as Jamila said, they're they're more about relationships. And so what would a you know a good quote unquote, relationship look like between local government with its citizens, right? That's a fundamental rethinking of what we're talking about um, that usually isn't part of resilience pro programming. Um, and I think thinking about, um, you know, we've come, we've been doing a lot of work around what does it mean to navigate emergence when things, um, you know, novel things are happening in a system, what does it actually mean in practice to do that, right? What are the capacities you need um, there's a lot of work going around imagination, lots of fun and um, interesting work trying to test out arts-based approaches and things like that. But all of it an effort to see, does it strengthen certain capacities that we may need to think about different kinds of change processes? So to me, success would be to start actually even thinking about it in those ways, rather than lumping it all as this one big thing and then just kind of inventing some indicators. Um, yeah, I'll pause there for now. Great, thanks. How about let's try from the very beginning when you asked for questions, how should develop economists and practitioners be thinking about resilience in the context of twin goals of development and climate resilience? And what can we take away from your knowledge? That seems particularly important with the COP going on in Egypt. Thanks. And yes, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I'm seeing the right question um, and understanding. It was in the it. webinar yes, chat at I the beginning. That. How should development economists be thinking about re resilience, the twin goals of development and climate? Any thoughts from others in the conversation on this one? I, I mean, I do think a lot of these shifts would be very relevant in that space. Um, you know, it's climate resilience and development to me seem quite interwoven rather than separate goals, but I, I'm assuming that in that policy context, they are being set up as separate goals. So I can imagine that um, thinking about the capacities required for development um, in contexts of climate change um, would be important here, yeah, the shifts to focus more on the processes of development and climate adaptation processes, for example. I know that in the big review, Michelle Lee mentioned around um, the work on climate, on maladaptation, for example, was finding that a lot of those interventions not only don't reduce vulnerability, they often just displace the vulnerability to another area. And so that brings with it these risks where we put boundaries around systems and and ignore the, the off-site burdens and the blind spots that the, the connections between systems bring. Um, and so I think that the, the, the open system focus would be very relevant for development economists working in the space, that vulnerability to climate change is not usually a local cause-effect problem, but actually a, a complex 
series of cross scale dynamics that need to be taken into consideration rather than handled at the local scale only. So I can, I think that everything that we worked on could be useful here, but I'm not a development economist, so maybe they wouldn't agree. Any thoughts um, from others? You're on mute. Jamila, did you want to say something? No? Okay. And sorry, maybe it's the late hour that many of us are sitting in at the moment and, and our energy levels are starting to flag or my synapses are slowing to be able to answer some of these questions. Um, but I'm hoping that- No, that was great, we... Belinda. Okay. Um, we only have a few minutes left and I'm wondering if any of you panelists would like to say anything in wrap up or Jamila you answered and others of you answered uh, questions by typing if there's anything you would like to highlight that's over in the answered category this would be a good time to do that I could just say really quickly there was a couple of people sort of flagging that question around the Canadian context um, and I was just going to which Jamila has uh, also answered um, briefly, but I think there is, um, I do know that the Pacific Salmon Initiative well, and, and there is some work being done by, I believe, Anne Solomon at SFU um, that you could, could take a look at. But I think, um, and I would say some of the examples that we reviewed actually, because we were um, looking at indigenous scholarship as well, there were, there were some actually from um, in the, in, from an Inuit uh, scholar. So there's some examples actually included in our review that would be relevant. I think there's also a, um, some really interesting work being done by the Heltsuk Nation along the central coast of Canada, um, actually looking at the relationship between language, um, three different language groups, I believe, and the, the territories of grizzly bears um, when and where they're um, moving salmon when they're eating them and consuming them. So there is quite a bit of work um, starting to kind of emerge around that space that you could take a look at. Um, I'll just leave it there for now since we only have a couple minutes left. And I guess just to add, yeah, that's a great example uh, or and context, new context. Thanks for bringing it up. And also from Neil about the um, uh, your project, the relationships project that you shared. Um, I just clicked on that briefly and it looks really exciting. So I think also just to say that we felt that this was a meaningful way to try to conceptualize and think about the change that we need to see and we did that in a broad but still specific context um, of the review that we did so just to say that it's really really encouraging and, and nice to hear about these things and do get in touch with us and um, with any of us I guess and it'd be really nice to continue some of these conversations. Yes no, I can echo that as well um, and to say that you know we've also been thinking quite hard about these shifts in the natural capital space which is after all the the topic of this discussion and I'm seeing some really exciting examples there so looking forward to exploring some of these ideas with those of you working on ecosystem services and accounting for nature in different ways of doing development um, and excited to test whether these shifts are relevant and what sort of innovations they're helping to surface in the work that we're all doing. Great, thank you so much panelists. Thank you for Bel Belinda for organizing this and thank you all for listening in and participating in all the various ways that were available to you today. And we look forward to continuing the conversation on email and in other ways. So thanks so much for joining and being part of this important work. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.